Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to our program tonight. Welcome to the first ever international virtual veterinary technician and veterinary nurse graduation celebration. This is a celebration of those technicians and nurses who have achieved their degrees and will be entering our profession as credentialed technicians and nurses. This is a celebration of the people who supported them to get here, the family members, the friends who were there to encourage and to coax and to maybe be a shoulder to cry on sometimes. This is a celebration of all technicians. They are the heart and soul of our practice and they deserve to be celebrated and inspired every now and then and that is what we intend to do tonight. So please, don't wait for us to carry all the load as far as inspiration. I want you in the comments to shout out the technicians that you know that should be celebrated. Let us know who they are. Let us know why they're wonderful. Pat them on the back. Encourage them. Lift them up. Make them feel appreciated. And let's truly celebrate all veterinary technicians and veterinary nurses tonight. Now. I am so thrilled to bring you the program that we have. Let's go ahead and get started. Our first speaker tonight is Kelsey Beth Carpenter, RVT. She is a veterinary technician. She is the social media manager at DrAndyRourke.com, and she is the creative force behind the internet sensation, Vet Tech Kelsey. Please, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming the one and only Kelsey Beth Carpenter. Hello graduates and welcome to the wonderful world of veterinary medicine. I am so excited to be here celebrating with all of you, my fellow Texan nurses today. And I cannot wait for the opportunity to get to work alongside some of you on the floor one day soon. But here's what I wanna to talk to you about today. You've been living in survival mode for a good long while now. You know, school does that to you. You're just trying to make it through that next exam or that next paper or that next semester. And now you've survived all that school had to throw at you only to be faced with a pandemic and have to survive all over again. But I don't want you to live in survival mode. You know, that was your past and that might be your temporary present, but it doesn't have to be your future. So here are a couple pieces of advice that have come out of the past 10 years of working as a veterinary technician to help you get out of survival mode and into a happy and healthy relationship with veterinary medicine. First, don't just survive your career. Work is a big part of our lives, but don't let it be your entire existence. I know it's tempting, especially now, you know, for many of you, this may be the first big position you fill in a veterinary clinic. And that's exciting. And it means you're going to get to see things and do things and experience things that are new and intriguing, but don't fall into the trap. I was in undergrad at UCLA when I first discovered vet med. Um, I got a job as an assistant at a 24 hour practice and I just fell head over heels in love as I'm sure a lot of you can relate. Um, I dove head first into the field and I could not get enough. I was still in school full time, but I somehow managed to cram 40 plus hours a week of clinic shifts into my schedule. And then, if that wasn't enough, I also started fostering dogs for a local rescue group, and I joined the vet med club at my school, and I added a biology double major to my plate. So, needless to say, it was a recipe for disaster, because it meant I sacrificed every other part of myself. I lost friends, I missed out on experiences, I abandoned my hobbies, uh, and to some extent I erased a part of myself in order to make more room for veterinary medicine. Vet med had become my identity long before I really realized what was happening. So here's my advice. Look at vet med as a relationship. You know, you can be excited about this new relationship, but just don't come on too strong, too fast, and scare it away. And don't invest every part of yourself into this one relationship. There's a lot more to you. Passion takes many forms, and vet med is definitely one of them, but school takes a lot out of you. And now that you're graduating, 
take this time to reinvest some of that passion back into the other things you once loved. You know, give vet med 100% on the days you're in the clinic, but never give it more than that because every percentage point you go beyond 100 ends up having to come from somewhere, which means it's subtracted from some other aspect of your life. Don't just survive your career, love it. And also remember to love the other parts of your life while you're at it. Second, don't just survive your clinic. Whether you've already got a full-time gig or you're just now venturing out into the workforce, please know what you're worth, which is a lot. Uh, they say those who can't do teach. Um, I like to say those who can't tech doctor. <laughs> But the point is, you are just a vital, just as vital a piece of this puzzle as any doctor, manager, or front desk rock star. So never let anyone make you feel less than, and don't you dare ever make anyone else feel less than either. I distinctly remember the first time a doctor asked for my opinion on a case. Uh, it was at my current clinic. And two of the vets were discussing the patient I had been working with all day. Uh, they were trying to get her to eat, but also keep her pain under control, which can often be a difficult balancing act. Um, well, in the middle of their discussion, one of them turns to me and asks what I think about her comfort level and whether I think we can start to wean her off of her CRI. And I think my jaw just about hit the ICU floor in that moment. Um, I had spent three years working in the field before I was ever asked for my professional opinion. But when I finally was, it opened up a whole new world to me. As veterinary technicians and nurses, we are not just there to fulfill treatment orders. Please, I beg of you, never become someone who simply checks off boxes. Look at the bigger picture, ask the important questions, pay attention to the details, learn to read your patients, and then offer your input. And if that input isn't well received, don't wait three years like I did to find somewhere where it is. You are brilliant and educated and intuitive, and if you don't know that confidently yet, don't just survive your current clinic. Find the hospital that will help you discover that about yourself. Third, don't just survive the human race. Yes, many of us got into this profession because we love animals and we're passionate about helping them. That's totally valid. But pet owners are not just there to be tolerated as a side effect of pets. They are actually arguably the most powerful tool in our treatment box. Humans are the ones who are going to bring the pet to you in the first place. Humans are the ones who are gonna provide the history you need and authorize the treatment plan you recommend. And humans, are the ones who will ultimately provide the at-home care, the care that's necessary to prevent and treat disease. Uh, last fall, I had a patient I will always remember. He was a deaf pity mix and he was awesome. He was the sweetest boy in the world, even when he wasn't feeling good. But I struggled with his case at times. You know, pities make weird noises anyways, but since he had been born completely deaf, some of the noises that came out of that dog were not normal. Um, and it was really difficult to assess if he was in pain or anxious or bored or what, because I just didn't know him and his individual quirks. But that dog's mom ended up being our most powerful indicator of how that dog was doing. Uh, the way he reacted when she would come to visit clearly demonstrated how well he was feeling. Um, she was able to interpret all his unique little noises and show me which ones were happy and which ones weren't. Uh, she told me about his food preferences and that he apparently liked to eat off the floor like a weirdo instead of from a bowl. And she even taught me a few signs I could use to communicate with him and tell him he was a good boy or that we were going on a walk. And ultimately she learned how to give injections at home uh, so she could manage his new chronic condition. I got into this profession because I wanted to help that dog, but ultimately I would not have been as successful if it hadn't been for that dog's mom. Humans 
are the vessel through which each pet gets the best possible care we can provide. So don't just tolerate pet owners. Don't just survive them. Learn to love them for what they can make possible for our patients. Fourth, do not just survive the tough cases. You know, that last case had a happy ending and that dog got to go home with his mom, but we all know that isn't always the case. Often what I personally find most difficult about veterinary medicine is that so much is out of our control. We cannot make people bring their pets into us. We cannot control how much money they have to spend on treatment or whether or not they will even listen to our recommendations. But when we focus on those things that we cannot control, those tough cases get a lot heavier and carrying that weight isn't a sustainable way to exist in your career. Last year, I was out of town for a veterinary conference, ironically, and I became extremely sick. I ended up in the hospital for a week, uh, the human hospital to clarify. <laughs> Uh, when I was first as, uh, admitted, it was in like the wee hours of the morning um, and I was in an incredible amount of pain. But that first nurse who was assigned to my case, she was a saint. Uh, being in the middle of the night and having come in through the ER, the doctors weren't very available to me, but that nurse advocated for me in a way I cannot even describe. She harassed those doctors <laughs> until she got me the pain control I needed. Uh, and I'm forever grateful that she did. She couldn't control when I was admitted or how busy the doctors were. But the one thing she could control was my pain. And that's exactly what she did. You know, and each and every one of you has that same exact power. They say our patients can't talk but I would argue they absolutely can. And it's through us as technicians and nurses. We can't control everything, but if we focus on what we can control in some of those more difficult cases, we can make a really profound difference in both the experience of the patient and the outcome of the case. So don't just survive the tough ones. Focus on what you can control and the impact you can have. Now fifth, this is a big one. Do not just survive your feelings. Yes, I am making you talk about your feelings. I'm sure you've heard it a million times before about compassion fatigue and burnout and the suicide rate in veterinary medicine, and you're probably sick of hearing about it, honestly. But I would be negligent not to force you to hear it again. You are your most important patient. One of the best veterinary articles I ever read was one written by the wonderful Dr. Cherie Busson. Um, and in it, she talks about making sure we meet the same needs for ourselves as we do for our patients. So I'll say it again. You are your most important patient. Every day, every single day, I want you to take the time to assess your vitals, your hydration status, your nutrition, your comfort level, your mentation. And you might be laughing at that now, but when we become licensed in veterinary medicine, we take a vow to do no harm. And I expect you to uphold that vow starting with yourself. I just recently actually had a patient in the ICU who had an abnormally long stay with us. I knew it was bad when I left work one week and came back the next week and he was still there. Um, at some point that dog inevitably became depressed, not just medically, but mentally depressed. Uh, we could just see the fight going out of him and it was really heartbreaking. So what did we do? We had his family visit daily. We set them up for a picnic in the back of the hospital under the trees so he could get some fresh air and be you know, surrounded by people who loved him. Uh, we made sure he was getting appropriate exercise every day. We calculated his RER and we ensured his nutrition was adequate and it was diverse. We gave him fresh bedding and we made sure he had his favorite stuffed animal with him at all times. Um, and we played music in his kennel and we gave him TLC whenever there was a free moment. We knew that that dog's mental status was vital to his physical recovery. And so we prioritized it. And I expect that same gold standard of care for you. 
You know, who are you to say that depression is any different than diabetes or that anxiety doesn't deserve the same kind of attention as Cushing's? Your brain is arguably your most unique and beautiful organ, and you need to care for it like you would any other vital anatomical structure. Do not just survive your feelings. Take those suckers to the doctor and get them the care they deserve. And always prioritize patient number one. Lastly, do not just survive your life. You've survived school. You've survived a pandemic. You've survived enough, frankly. You are magical creatures. You are the unicorns who found themselves on the diverse paths that led here and now. And you deserve much more than to just survive. You deserve to thrive. So while you're out there making the world a better place for everyone else, make sure it's a great place for you too. I say all of these things because you've worked hard and you deserve it, but also because I want you here for a long time to come. So graduates, congratulations. I cannot wait for the honor of working alongside you one day. Welcome to the team. Ladies and gentlemen, our next presenter truly is a source of inspiration and motivation for technicians and nurses all across the world. She is the owner and founder of Motivatum Consulting. She is a past president for the Ontario Association of Veterinary Technicians, and she is the director of learning and engagement at P3 Veterinary Partners. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Sanani Ratnayaka, RVT. Veterinary technicians, technologists, and nurses, class of 2020. My guess is this isn't how you pictured it, but then again, was any of this process how you pictured it? Some people wanna become veterinary technicians because they've literally been present in the industry in some capacity for years. They knew exactly what the job was about and what they were getting themselves into. But then there's the rest of us. Come on, you know who you are, and I'm one of them too. You wanted to work with animals, but you had no idea what the scope of this job was before you signed up for it. This isn't like human medicine where they just work on one species. Oh no, you need to know your normal temperature for a dog versus a snake, the resting heart rate of a rabbit versus a cow, and the various diseases commonly associated with every species, from rats to horses to parrots. You've worked through math class and behavior class, memorizing lists upon lists of pharmaceuticals, procedures, equipment, bacteria, and more importantly, You've had to learn how to critically apply and interpret the memory work, then factor in common sense and the real life struggles that come with animals not reading the same books as us. That diabetic cat is never going to just be a diabetic cat. It's going to be um, 15 years old, pleasantly <clears throat> plump, uh, with a heart condition and deteriorating kidneys, uh, with a strong preference for a kitten food you've likely never heard of, but don't worry, you know that it comes in a green bag. Oh, and it'll have all kinds of opinions about being touched or maybe even looked at. But you know what the funny thing is? You will love that cat. You will love that cat like it is your own. You will make excuses for its behavior all day long because that is what we do. We love animals. We are the animal fanatics, the saviors of wildlife and pet enthusiasts. We are the slightly odd person at a party who is sitting on the floor in the kitchen with the dog while the other people are in another room mingling. We're the friend who blows off a party to just go and be in the barn. We run out of meetings and classes and family dinners because a bird just hit the window and we want to scour the ground to make sure it's all right. And we are the strangers who go up to a loose dog in the park secretly hoping it's lost so we can keep it. I mean, so we can help it find its way home. We can't stand people fluids, but we can totally handle getting a little poop on us as long as it comes out of an animal. And when we watch a movie, people getting killed is just part of the plot, but oh, if they hurt an animal, you better watch out. To the families. Do you think it's strange that I know so much about your loved one? Well, it's because they found their people. We are their people. 
As a very proud registered veterinary technician, it is my immense honor to be able to welcome each and every one of you as graduating technicians into our profession. You see, we get it. We get you. Now let's clear one thing up. I don't want to hear any rumblings about how you are not a graduate. You are graduating. I know that the world is a little bit strange right now, and I know that for some of you, school is technically not even over for a few more months still, but let's not lose track of what you've accomplished. This celebration isn't about a specific date. It isn't about a specific location or even a set of skills. It's about your effort and your mindset. You've been working for years, some of you for what feels like a lifetime, to get here and you are here. A piece of paper? That's not gonna make you a veterinary technician, it really isn't. Your desire to be the best version of yourself, to constantly be growing and learning and looking out for your colleagues, your commitment to navigate the ethics of our role, to listen and not judge the pet and animal owners with who you cross paths, to keep a positive attitude and to advocate for the animal always, even when it's tough. Being present, being dedicated, that's what defines whether or not you are a veterinary technician. Are you afraid that you don't know everything yet? Well, one thing to put your mind at ease that I can absolutely definitely promise you is that you don't. <laughs> and actually you never will. That has nothing to do with leaving school early or graduating late. That's simply the reality of transition from school to real life, especially for us because this is medicine and medicine changes all the time, which is what makes our role so special. There's always something to learn, a new way to grow. There's new technology and drugs and procedures and equipment and software and protocols and things are changing all the time. And just when you think you have it all figured out, well, then something else comes up. And that's why being present and being dedicated are so important. Something I really wanted to tell you and something that I want your family and your friends to understand too is that this is no ordinary job. Being a veterinary technician is a foundation. It's a part of who you are, not what you do. I say that because you now have a skill set and knowledge that can be applied in so many different ways different fields and work environments, different titles and roles. And what you choose to do with being a veterinary technician is completely up to you. The world is at your fingertips. Through my time in practice, I realized that all joking aside, I actually like people. The things that made me frustrated about pet owners weren't driven by them being bad people. The majority of the time, the difficult clients I encountered were difficult because they had feelings. They were either uneducated about something I was educated about, or they were not appreciating the gravity of a situation, or they were feeling I was not appreciating the gravity of a situation. These feelings are not born out of a lack of caring. They're absolutely because the person cared. The majority of people you come across at work in your lifetime will be difficult because of a communication issue, their inability to articulate what they think or how they feel, their emotions running too high, or their lack of understanding, and it's up to us to bridge that gap for them, to be respectful, to be patient, to listen, to not pass judgment, to educate, to give the benefit of the doubt. Here's the thing, in almost any job you take anywhere, there will be people. <laughs> I'm sorry to break it to you, but if you did choose this work because you love animals and kind of don't like people that much, then you missed a memo along the way. This is a team sport. It will forever serve you well to remember that what ultimately stands between you and your ability to help an animal is most often a person. We can't control everything, but we can control ourselves and how we choose to handle our part of each interaction. And I'm not saying you shouldn't stand up for yourself if somebody is truly being difficult, but just be careful not to jump to conclusions. Be open to other perspectives. It's often not about you. It's about somebody else struggling because they do care and it's coming out of them in all the wrong ways. Never lose sight of the fact that at one time you or perhaps your family were uneducated pet owners too. Every day that passes, you are wiser than the day before, but remembering your roots allows you to be relatable and have the perspective that will ultimately help you help animals. My interest in communication, my interest in people, and 
frankly, my love for the people of veterinary medicine has brought me here. Well, not literally here because this is actually my bedroom, but here with all of you. Over the years, I've had the privilege to work on various veterinary teams, run a referral service, be a manager of a veterinary team, be an industry representative, a president of a board twice, be the owner of my own consulting company, be a media spokesperson, be a director, be a speaker, a creator, a facilitator, all of these things because I decided to become a veterinary technician. It wasn't always easy. In fact, sometimes it was downright hard. To be honest, I've been told no as many times, probably more than I've actually been told yes. But no is a funny thing. I tend to take it as a not right now. Just because it hasn't been done before, it doesn't mean it can't be done. Your trajectory is completely up to you. Don't let the judgment of other people ever affect your dreams. I don't mean that in a fluffy, whimsical, you should put that quote in a meme with a sunset behind it kind of way. I mean that in a, if you believe you'd be great at something and you see a need and you can picture yourself there, then who cares if somebody else doesn't share that vision? That vision is yours. So what are you gonna do with this superpower of being a veterinary technician? How are you going to define yourself? Because being a veterinary technician doesn't define you. It's a part of who you are, but you are so many things, which is perfect because there are so many places that could use somebody just like you. There's literally a place for everybody. And what you do now may not be what you do forever, but it will help. We are all a sum of our experiences. Every experience comes with a choice. Will I use this to be better or will I let it hold me back? It's true, not all experiences are great, Early in my career, I was picked on by a head technician who pretended to be super sweet, but made me cry all the time. I'm not going to pretend that I immediately bounced out of that experience a better, more resilient person because I didn't. I second guessed myself all the time. I wondered if I'd made the right choice, but in the end, I found a place that was better for me. I was surrounded by people who cared about me and respected me and helped me to learn. I developed better habits, stronger skills, and more confidence. And in the right environment, we thrive. This may not feel like the right environment, but there is a strange upside to actually graduating during this time of COVID. You see, we are working furiously right now to keep up with the changing environment, changing um, protocols, creating new ways of doing things to accommodate providing veterinary care during a pandemic. We're stuck in old habits, learning new routines in our new reality, but for you, there is this glorious benefit starting here within COVID. No old habits to break or mourn. This is your reality. You can come in right now and be a breath of fresh air for our teams. Many of you have already faced adversity, hearing rejection before you even applied for a job because your placements have had to cancel. It's not easy. I can't imagine. But here you are, tuned in to a virtual graduation, ready to take on the world. If I may, a quick word to those of you watching from our veterinary community who are not new graduates. These bright-eyed technicians will be knocking at your door. Remember that their perspectives, innovative solutions, and growth mindsets will be invaluable to you. Skills can be taught, but attitudes, dedication, passion, those are the real traits to watch for. Graduates, I know this isn't what you had in mind, and it's okay to be sad about certain things. This didn't end the way you anticipated. No last hangouts, last cafeteria food, last group dinners, last days as a class. No official feeling of closure. And what about all the goodbye hugs? It's okay to be sad, but it's also okay to be excited. What are you excited about? Do you think about what it will be like in a year from now and where you would like to be? Let's make a pact just because, you know, it's just you and I here right now. I want you to promise me that you will remember your superpowers. Be who and what you want to be. Take everything you have learned and are going to learn and layer it on top of who you are. That is how you will succeed as a veterinary technician. And I can't wait to see where you end up. Congratulations, my new friends. 
I am so honored to have been a part in some small way of this very special moment in your life. Ladies and gentlemen, our presentation tonight would not be possible without the support of Banfield Pet Hospital. Please, please join me in welcoming my friend and Chief Medical Officer at Banfield, Dr. Molly McAllister. Hello, 2020 graduates from veterinary technician schools from across the country. My name is Dr. Molly McAllister and I'm Chief Medical Officer at Banfield Pet Hospital. I'm so happy to welcome you into our profession, this culmination of your years of hard work, to join us in being able to deliver excellent care to the pets who need us. I'm excited to introduce to you Kathy Trabel, who's an amazing veterinary technician and practice manager here with us at Banfield. Hello fellow technicians. My name is Kathy Trebold and I'm a CVT. I've been a CVT for over 20 years. I love this profession. I love what I get to do every day. I can honestly say that. I vowed the day that I graduated that I wanted to make a difference every day and the day that I stopped making a difference would be the day that I switched careers. I'm still here after 20 years making a difference somewhere, somehow, every day and absolutely love it. My advice to you is find your passion. Find what you want to pursue and do it. Don't second guess yourself. Don't take no for an answer and just be convicted in that. Be the voice for you and be the voice for your pet. Be a part of the solution, not the problem. Congratulations, veterinary technician class of 2020. Congratulations, veterinary technician class of 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, our last speaker holds so many titles, I can't begin to scratch the surface. He does so much for veterinary technicians and veterinary nurses everywhere. Kenichiro Yegi is an RVT. He is a VTS in emergency and critical care and a VTS in small animal internal medicine. He also has a master's degree. He is at Cornell and he is the president of the North American Veterinary Technician Association. Ladies and gentlemen, NAFTA President, Ken Yegi. Congratulations everyone on reaching another milestone in your career. When I think about my own career, I go back to a simple yet very difficult question for me to answer. And the person that asked it was Andy Rourke. He asked me, hey Ken, what are you about? And at that point in time, I had so many things that I had already done um, or was doing in that situation that uh, involved the profession in so many different ways. And um, the reason why he asked that question, what are you about, was I think he really wanted me to think about, why do I exist? And I was ag in agony. I could not answer that question right off the bat. And uh, so I was thinking to myself, who the heck am I? I am involved in many different things. And it also goes back to who did I want to be? And uh, when people ask me how I came to the point that I am today and what I do today, uh, oftentimes I answer it by saying, you know what? I didn't mean to be a veterinary technician. And let me explain that further. That I, I was going through high school. I had to decide whether I was going to college or not, decided I wanted to, uh, but I also didn't know what I wanted to do. Being an MD, being in human medicine, being a doctor was something that was very well respected. Uh, but at the same time, being an introvert and a shy one at that, uh, I actually didn't like people all that much. Uh, and uh, I know that's a very stereotypical thing to say um, as a veterinary professional, but let me uh, explain further on that as well. Uh, and so I thought, why not veterinary medicine? I went to UC Davis and studied animal science. I was accepted into uh, veterinary school. And uh, I quickly found out though that during the first year, I wasn't really thriving. I moved away from my home state. Um, I lost my support structure. I'm sure there were rigors of the program and it doesn't really matter um, what the exact reason may have been, but it was ultimately on me. And I ended up dropping out. So I took a break. I knew I still wanted to be in veterinary medicine. And so uh, that's where I ran into Adobe Animal Hospital. 
saw a newspaper ad for um, that they were hiring and I started working there as a veterinary assistant and that's where my next 18 years in the career uh, had been. And uh, Dr. Roos, who is the owner of the hospital, one day was showing Nancy Shaffron, who came in to do some CE, uh, uh, he, she, he was showing her around and was coming into the lunchroom where I was. And so I could hear them coming through. And as soon as they came in, uh, Dr. Roos pointed at me and said, oh, here's a guy who dropped out of vet school and now works as a tech. And I thought to myself, man, what an introduction, what a way to introduce me. And um, it made my feelings sink uh, quite a bit. And uh, I actually wanted to disappear in that moment. Um, but when Nancy heard that, uh, she kind of gave her raised eyebrow look, thoughtful look that she has. And she asked me, and do you like it? And that's when I said, you know what? I do. The one-on-one -on -one nurse nursing care for the patients that brings on the technical and cognitive challenges that, that we face. And being able to help patients go from being sick and being able to go home to their families. Everything about it, I really liked. And when she heard that, she said, well then get yourself credentialed. There's a thing called veterinary technician specialist certification that you can pursue after that. And each time we spoke uh, after that, she always gave me one extra nudge to think about what's next on my uh, ability to pursue uh, better professional development and make myself a better person. And so um, I credit her uh, along with uh, many others like her for where I am today. And so I re really feel fortunate about uh, having found Adobe through a newspaper ad, met Dr. Roos, who uh, showed her into that lunchroom, and I was in that lunchroom at the time, and I had that interaction that served as a catalyst for who I am today. And so I feel like I was really lucky. And we tend to consider luck being something like you were in the right place at the right time. But also, there's an additional element to luck, that you are in the right mindset to be able to take that situation and make something out of it. It's a chance encounter, but you have to be in the right state of mind in order for you to be able to take that kind of scenario and actually make it something productive. And so this is where um, I would say, as you're going through your career, definitely make sure that you are in the right state of mind and paying attention to your personal wellness as you go through this profession. It is something that is very emotional. I also like to remember that there are those that have and will continue to support you, so you're not alone in this. And be sure to recognize those people and let them know how much of an impact they had in your career. Now today, those may be your parents, your friends, your spouses, um, your mentors, or your instructors. Uh, but uh, now more so than ever in today's world, the connection that we have with each other is going to be important. And so uh, even though I was told to credential, I didn't uh, do so right away. It took many years. Uh, I was being sidetracked by a second job uh, and life in general, I'll just say. But on June 25th, 2005, I had a life-changing event. Our first daughter, Harumi, was born. As she was delivered, we actually noticed that she wasn't crying or wailing like a normal baby should. There was a lot of commotion in the room. The medical team seemed like they were uh, scrambling to care for her. There was an overhead page that said RT to delivery room stat. And so that's a respiratory therapist. And um, Iris was looking at me asking, is she okay? And I had no idea because every time we asked a question on the status, they could not tell us. And it was a real emergency situation for sure. She was eventually admitted to the neonatal ICU. And the diagnosis that we got was right-sided lung agenesis. One side of her lung didn't develop. She was placed on mechanical ventilation. We were hospitalized for a month and a half, but after a month and a half of being at the hospital, visiting on a daily basis, receiving the amazing care from the nurses and the medical team there, we were finally able to take her home. Harumi was able to spend time at home with her brothers and sisters, the furry ones, and um, we were able to spend time at home as a family. A couple of weeks after we took her home, she was readmitted to the pediatric ICU on an emergency basis because she went into respiratory distress. 
there we did everything we can for her but eventually we had to make the decision to actually let her go after that we took a break from everything i remember thinking during that time period um, that life might as well be over uh, many dark moments but after several months of being in a dark place there were a few things that helped me get myself back up the first thing and the most important thing was finding out that iris and i were in the same dark place and that we really needed to be there for each other there were also people like dr roos and the adobe family who had reached out to make sure we were doing okay And when I started thinking about where do I go from here, one of the things that kept coming back to my mind was the interactions that I had with the nurses that were caring for Harami. The nurses were our advocates. From the very beginning, they said, come and visit any time. There, there must have been some books that you wanted to read to her. There must have been some music that you wanted to play for her. Bring all that in. Spend your time with the uh, with your child, and they advocated for the doc uh, with uh, advocated for her with the doctors to try to get her off the ventilator and to be able to have her go home nice and healthy. Now, um, obviously, uh, that uh, the outcome wasn't what we all would have wanted to see, but we would not have not had any time at home without them. And so it really made me reevaluate our role in veterinary medicine. What are we actually trying to do? We're patient advocates. We're patient advocates with compassion, patience, the skills, empathy, and the kindness that it takes in order to care for our patients. And our, old, our, our role allows us to save more than just our patients. So this is how I got involved in so many things that I get involved in. I got myself credentialed, Nancy told you so, many years ago and finally did it. I uh, got my VTS certifications, obtained my master's degree. I applied for the ICU supervisor position and eventually became the manager so that I can create an environment where people can thrive in playing our role. And I started public speaking and providing education, uh, which is what took me to my current position in providing simulation-based learning and CPR certification um, so that people can be confident and competent in the role that they play. This is where I got involved with NAFTA, VEX, the Academy of Veteran Emergency Critical Care Technicians and Nurses, so that I can try to make field-wide changes that would help us serve our role better. And through all that, I kind of go back to Nancy's question, where she asked, do I like it? Basically was asking, does what you do matter to you? And the answer was yes. Andy's question was, what matters to you the most so I can focus? And I can tell you that my experiences have certainly shaped what matters to me. So I leave you with a question as you step into the rest of your life as a veterinary technician or nurse. What matters to you? Now, you may or may not have that uh, answer right now, but if you do, put yourself in a place where you can do the things that matter to you and don't compromise on that. Also know that there can be ups and downs in life. And while you pursue what matters to you, it's okay to take a break if you have to recharge to find your way. What matters can change over time and it'll be a constant journey. And you have the ability to make choices that shape your way. So make sure you are playing an active role in your career path. And I said that I agonized about the question, what are you about? Um, or what matters the most to you? Uh, and I still would say that I can't completely answer that question, but a big part of it I know is that, you know what? Each of you matter to me. As fellow veterinary professionals and also the future of our profession. Even though I said that I got into this field because maybe I didn't like people, and that's what I thought, I've actually made a choice to stay. I know that now, because of the people, I choose to be a veterinary technician. So once again, congratulations on this huge milestone. 
Welcome to an amazing profession. I'm honored to call you a colleague and a friend. I'll be looking forward to all that we can accomplish together alongside each other. And if we run into each other, I would love to have that conversation to talk about what matters the most to you. I will see you then. And again, congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you have enjoyed this celebration of veterinary technicians and veterinary nurses across the globe. I hope that you found something inspiring and, 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 and uplifting here. I am sad to bring this evening to a close, but I would like to give a couple words of my own. I hope that that's okay. I've been uh, thinking about this a lot and talking with my technicians, and I've come up with five, five quick piece of advice that, that I would like to give, things that, that I feel like are very important that I've seen with technicians and that, and that has affected me in my own career. Ladies and gentlemen, I have been so blessed to work with wonderful technicians my entire career. They have saved my bacon more times than I account, and they mean the world to me. I want them to be successful, and I want them to be happy, and this is the things that I want to say to them, regardless of where they are in their careers. Here goes. Number one, remember to be patient with people. We see people all day long, and they are the most frustrating part of the process. I think we all can agree. If pets came with their own wallets, we would be so blessed. But we deal with people. We deal with people. They are the ones who give us our jobs, and they are so important. We deal with families, guys. We're not just about pets. We are about taking care of people. We're about supporting them. We're about keeping families together and strengthening that bond between the animal and the human. Sometimes we see people who give us a hard time and sometimes people are not nice. It's so important to remember that while this is just the 10th client we've seen today, this is the first time that they have been in an emergency situation in maybe years and maybe in their life. We see people on their worst day. We see them when they are truly heartbroken. We see them when they are truly afraid. That's the price that we pay for being so important and for doing such valuable, meaningful work is that we see people in crisis. And they manifest their, their fears and their frustrations in different ways, in strange ways. But be kind and, and, and just remember to be patient. Everyone's fighting a battle that we don't know anything about. And the more patience we can have, the more good that we can do in this world, and the more enjoyment we can get from our, uh, from our job. Remember in every single euthanasia that this, this may be the, our third one in the day, but this is a major life event for that pet owner. This is them saying goodbye to possibly their best friend, to a, to a companion that's been through with them through God knows what. Be patient. And be kind. And if we hold on to that, we will do a better job, but we will enjoy our work more. And so patience truly is a virtue. Let's all try to remember that. Number two, never stop learning. Never stop learning. I'll never forget the day that one of our technicians came to me, and she was a wonderful technician, and she said to me, Dr. Work, I'm thinking about leaving. And I said, why? Why would you leave? You're wonderful. You're great here. Why would you go? And she said, I, uh, I don't want to be like Sarah. I said, what do you mean you don't want to be like Sarah? And she said, Sarah has been here for 30 years. And Sarah does the exact same job every day. For the last 20 years, she's been the head surgery technician and she just goes in in the morning. She does the exact same thing. She does the same thing all morning. She cleans up in the afternoon, puts everything away, and she goes home. I cannot do that. As I look ahead, and this is a young technician, as I look ahead, I, I don't want to do the same thing every day for 20 years. I, I just, I don't. And some of us want that sort of regularity. Some of us like that consistency, but most of us don't. And I said to her, no, 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 no. That's not what this has to be. This is a choice that we make. You, you can do whatever you want. Your credentials, your, uh, your certification as a veterinary technician, or veterinary nurse, they, they're, they're not the end of your journey. They're the beginning of your journey. The world is wide open in front of you. Veterinary medicine is a house with a million rooms. 
never stop learning, never stop growing, never stop changing. If you're getting bored, it's time to explore new things. It's time to look into new areas of medicine, right? Maybe this it's time to, to grow your skills in anesthesia. Maybe it's time to become a, a dental technician for a while and really go deep into it. Maybe you should move to specialty practice. Maybe you should move to emergency practice. Maybe you should see exotic animal medicines and put those tools in your tool belt and really say, I'm going to grow this year. I am going to learn to work with exotic animals or with birds or with things I haven't done before. Maybe it's time to, um, to, to move into management. Maybe it's time to step up and, and lead a team of technicians. Maybe that's a challenge that will motivate you, give you something new and something different. Maybe it's time to move into industry. Maybe it's time to go and work with a diagnostic company or, or a pharmaceutical company or, or a food company and become an educator and a champion of something that you believe in. You don't have to know where you're going in your career. All you have to know is where you're going next. And where you're going next should involve you growing and moving on and getting better because that will keep you engaged. That will make you feel like what you're doing is meaningful. You have endless options. You always have options. There will always be a demand for veterinary technicians. Guys, I look around during the COVID pandemic, which is what brings us here online, and there are puppies in every single house. The shelters are empty. The breeders don't have any dogs to send to homes. Everyone is picking up new pets. They're expanding their family and they're building those bonds. We are going to be so busy for so long, years and years, and it's wonderful. And your skills are so, so valuable. Never stop learning. Never stop growing. There are so many opportunities for you to do whatever you want to do. So keep working on yourself and keep changing and keep things fresh. Number three, remember that you are not a gopher. You are not a dog holder. You are a credentialed veterinary technician. I want you to be proud. You have knowledge and skills and experience that other people do not have. You've worked so hard to be here. Use that. I don't want to see you standing around waiting to be told what to do. That's not, that's not people using you effectively. The, the doctors are not getting out of you what they should. I want to see you in a place where you are working autonomously, where you are working freely, where you know the systems and the protocol and you are moving independently and you are enjoying what you're doing and you're feeling a sense of ownership and you are feeling that you are making a difference in the lives of these pets. And if you ever find yourself not in that place, I want you to do me a favor and I want you to do something about it. And that may mean moving somewhere else. But do that. Because you are important and you should be proud of what you have accomplished and of your skills. And you should be in a hospital that is going to use you for those skills. And so if you're not being used, I want you to do something about that. And never forget that you are a, a credentialed veterinary technician. And that's something to be proud of. Number four, and I don't want this to sound harsh but you cannot make pet owner priorities your priorities. You have skills and knowledge and you have an ability to help and people will come to you for help and that is wonderful and you should help them. You should be intentional about how you help them. You should help them in the ways that fit with you and your life. You cannot take on all the priorities of other people. One of the biggest pitfalls that I see for technicians is, 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 is being so giving that they don't set boundaries, that they don't say no, that they don't say, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I don't want you to be happy in your first year as a technician. I want you to be happy for as long as you want to be a technician. That's what I want for you. But you cannot do that if you do not say no. You cannot do that if you take the pain and the priorities and you hold them inside of yourself. You cannot absorb all the pain that we see around us in the world. You are a champion. You are a helper. You are someone who will do wonderful things in this world. But if you don't set boundaries, if you don't protect yourself emotionally, if you are not able to let things go, if you insist on carrying the burdens of pet owners who come in, you will burn out. You will give all you have to give in the first year or two or five and you won't want to go on. And that's a terrible loss for everyone. It's a terrible loss for me as a doctor because I will lose a wonderful technician from our profession. And it's a terrible loss for the pets who will not have you to take care of them. 
And it's a terrible loss for the practice that you work in and for the pet owners who, who need you. I want you to remember that you can help and you will help, but you need to be able to set some boundaries and you need to be able to say no and you need to be able to leave people's problems with them. Do your best and help in the way that you can help. But then you have to be able to let go. You cannot give entirely of yourself. You know why? Because you cannot pour from an empty cup and you cannot feed from an empty pantry. If you give everything that you have, there'll be nothing left for yourself. There'll be nothing left for your family. There'll be nothing left for your friends. And that is a cold and lonely place to be and I do not ever want you to be there. You cannot make the priorities and the problems of pet owners your problems. Do what's best. Do what's reasonable. And keep going forward while taking care of yourself so that you can be here for the long term because that is the greatest good that you can do. And that brings me to my last point. You have got to love this profession and you have got to love this job to do it. What you are embarking on is difficult. It's challenging. It's a hard job being a veterinary technician or a veterinary nurse. You've got to love it. And the only way that you can love it is to see it as a source of meaning and purpose in your life. It will be hard. It will, there will be bad days. There will be wonderful days though. There will be amazing days. But there will be deep and meaningful and ongoing challenges that you will go through. And you have to find happiness in those challenges. Life is not about being joyful and, and having puppies and kittens all the time. And that's great and that happens. But the people who love this profession and last in this profession are the people who see meaning in the struggles of the day to day in helping when we can and helping again and again and again and again. And sometimes things will go well and sometimes things will go bad. But know that you're doing good work. You're doing God's work if you believe that. But you have got to find purpose here. And guys, that is such a wonderful thing that we have and you can have too. How many people do you know who wonder what they're doing with their lives? They wonder what they're doing here. What are, what are we doing day to day? Guys, we in veterinary medicine, we have an answer to that. We are we're helping families. We're saving lives. We're doing something that deeply matters. How few people can say that? That is what matters in this life. And guys, you are set up to have a life of meaning and purpose. And that is wonderful. You have got to believe that. And you have to realize that that doesn't mean we're always going to be happy or it's always going to be fun. But it's always going to be purposeful and meaningful if you let it be. So you've got to love what we do. So put yourself into it and love it deep down because that is the most important thing. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. It has been a deep honor to host this presentation tonight. Congratulations to all of our graduates. Congratulations to the families and the friends of our graduates. And congratulations to all the technicians and the nurses around the world. You make a difference. You are the heart and soul of our profession and we are blessed to have you. Thank you so much for all that you do. Good night.